Let's stand and sing, church. What a great day we have to celebrate all that the Lord is doing and all that He's going to do in the future. So let's praise His name for what He's done. Sing, you're calling me over. You're calling me over. You're pulling me close. With love you surround me, yeah. you give me hope, yeah, yeah. You're taking me deeper, you're making me whole. With grace you redeem me, yeah. you restore my soul. Now. Yep, 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 there we go. All right. Um, we're in such a friendly church, you know. Uh, no, uh, I want to thank you for being here. I'm Pastor Brady Johnston, and just am excited about the chance. Uh, today is one of my favorite Sundays. Uh, we call this uh, pop-up Sunday or, or traditionally uh, backpack blessings, but we are uh, the Sunday before school starts. We always use uh, part of our service as a chance to pray over and bless our students, faculty, administrators, anyone that has anything to do with schools for this next year, uh, because we believe as, as a church that we are called to be a blessing to our community, to invite the Lord to do wonderful things in the lives of our students, our, our schools. And so we're excited. Uh, so thankful that you're here. If you're a first-time guest, thank you for showing up today. Uh, today's going to be a lot of fun in the sense we get to, to pray over you. Uh, we also have a carnival after church, which is going to be a lot of fun. Hopefully you saw it. And let's pray the overcast skies hold because it doesn't feel too bad out there right now. Um, but man, so thankful that you're here. I'm going to ask those who are praying for our students and faculty and teachers to go ahead and come forward. 
um, we're going to spread out our, our prayers. Our prayers will be behind, behind the altar, and they'll hand out these backpack tags to you. Uh, it's just a reminder, something for you to hook on your backpack to remember that you have been prayed over and blessed and that God is indeed with you um, as you get ready for this school year and go throughout this school year because there might be some times in the school year that you need to be reminded of that. We all go through those in life. And so we'll invite you to come down. So what I want you to do is I want you to go up to, to one of the people. You might get in line. But I want you, as you come to them, I want you to say your name so that we can pray over you by name. So please tell, tell the person praying over you your name, um, and they will pray over you and give you a backpack tag. So we're just going to use our time and service for this. If you're someone who, who maybe your, your kids are graduated or, or they're not here and you're not a, a part of this necessarily coming out to be prayed over, uh, please join us in praying. You can pray from out there and ask God to move in the hearts and lives of everyone who comes out there. So uh, let's have some time. Uh, come on up if you're a part of the school system in any way, whether you're driving buses, um, uh, you know, whatever it might be, welcoming people in the beginning, a student, whatever it might be, we invite you to come.
All right, church. Uh, I'm going to invite all of our kids to come back up here and to meet me for a blessing as you get ready for Children's Church. All right. All right. Okay. Y'all got your tags? Some of y'all left your tags? Okay, okay, good. We're so excited about this school year and what it means for y'all and how much you're going to grow in this time. And so let's have a prayer together. Can you fold your hands for me? All right, let's, let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for all of our children. I thank you for what you have in store for them in this year and the way that they're going to experience your love and your blessings. I thank you for our opportunity to pray over them. God, there's no greater thing that we can do than to lift people up to your throne of grace, knowing that you hear our prayers and you respond. Be with them as they go to worship. May they feel and know how loved they are by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, let us continue in our worship. I sing about him who died for us. See, he has walked.
His glory for our shame. Like He rose in freedom from the ashes. Jesus, we do welcome you. We recognize you in this place, all authority. Heaven has chosen a place in our hearts, and so we are so, so grateful. So, God, we submit those hearts to you right now. We take all that we have, everything that we have going on. We just lay it at the foot of the cross. Each and every time we gather together is our opportunity to lay ourselves down at the foot of the cross. All authority rests in you, Jesus. So what you declare in this place, in your name, may it come to pass. Not our will, but yours be done. With all the strength that we have in us. We thank you, Jesus. So have your way today. As your word is opened and declared today, have your way. And as we gather and as we listen, have your way. And as we sing your praises, have your way, Jesus. That's all we desire. And we remember this prayer that you taught us to pray long ago. And so together we say, <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Uh, so in the, the movie The Bucket List, maybe you've, you've seen it, uh, starring Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson, uh, there's a scene in the movie where uh, the two of them are sitting on the pyramids in Egypt, and it's Morgan Freeman's character who begins to share some insight into the Egyptians' belief about death. And he said, did you know that the Egyptians, when you died and were entering the gates of the afterlife, held the belief that you were asked one question at the gates? Have you found joy in your life? Now, there is no historical evidence that the Egyptians actually believe that. <laughs> like, we're just being, being honest about it. Like, there's not. Uh, I mean, Hollywood is never bound to pesky things like reality. Uh, but, but the question holds, doesn't it? It's a great question. It makes for a compelling scene. And I'll ask you the question, like, have you found joy in your life? Do you know what it means to live and this deep sense of joy. Now, I think we were created to experience joy. And, and part of the reason we know this is because there's a desire within us to experience this kind of joy. In fact, when we don't have that kind of joy in our lives, we know it, don't we? Like you were, you were aware of not having joy in your life, and it feels like something is missing, doesn't it? 
Now, C.S. Lewis, who's one of the, the greatest Christian thinkers in the last hundred years, said, said this is why we feel and want joy and feel that there's an absence when, when we're missing joy in our life. C.S. Lewis says we were created that way. We were created to experience joy that in the same way that the human body physically is to run on oxygen to thrive, like so the human soul is created in a way to experience joy. That's why it feels so unnatural when we are not living in a place of joy. And yet, you and I know there are seasons in our life where joy is hard to come by. And you probably know what it's like to be in a season where you're experiencing some kind of joy and then some circumstance comes that just rocks you to the core. And it feels like it steals that joy from you. And it leaves you wanting and desiring joy. But it feels so far from you. And it leaves us asking the question, like, where? Where can I find joy? How can I find joy in my life? And if you've ever asked that question, one of the greatest places that we can turn to in the Bible is the book of Philippians. And I'll invite you to, if you have your Bible with you, to turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians, the book of Philippians is a letter actually written to a church that Paul founded in just three months of ministry in the city of Philippi. He founded a, a church with a group of people who became lifelong friends and partners in ministry. Uh, the letter itself, Philippians, is short. It's only four chapters. But in it, the Apostle Paul uses the word rejoice or joy 16 times. 16 times in four short chapters. We look at this letter and, and what it means, and we look at Paul's circumstances surrounding and the content of what Paul offers us, and we see that Paul has something to teach us about joy. Uh, and so part of my challenge to you, maybe you've never studied a book of the Bible, we have a resource and we call Waypoints or Daily Devotional Guide that if you start with us over the next five weeks, you'll study all the verses of the book of Philippians. So I would encourage you to join us in that. In fact, extra credit, uh, this is a challenge to everybody here. I would love for you this week to sit down and to read the letter of Philippians from beginning to end in one sitting. It sounds like a lot. Don't, don't be intimidated by it. Um, it's only four chapters. It will take you uh, 20 minutes, and that's even with your kids interrupting you. All right? Like, it's been tested. All right? 20 minutes, even with, with interruption. <laughs> I was reading the past week, and my kids kept coming in. I'm like, would you stop bothering me? I'm trying to read a book about joy. You know, like... <laughs> Oh, man, that's, that's parenting for you, isn't it, right? Um, but, hey, let's, let's turn. The Apostle Paul, like he has, I think, just a treasure for us in, in our words today. So let's turn to Philippians chapter 1. We'll start in verse 12. Paul says, Now I want you to know, and this is to the church, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. So the obvious question here at this point is, well, what has happened to Paul? You know, what, what is it that's happened to him? And, and an explanation of what Paul's talking about here was that, when, that Paul, when he was called by Jesus to go and to preach, boy, this thing is just a lot of fun. Um, when, when Paul was called by Jesus to go um, and preach, he took the gospel on several missionary journeys to go and extend the reach of the good news of Jesus to places it had never touched. And Paul had years of faithful ministry. And, and we find in Acts chapter 21, after this mission, he's in Jerusalem, and he is accused of causing trouble in the city, of defiling the temple. And what happens is Paul is arrested, and he's tried by the Jewish council, 
And then Paul is passed from the Jewish religious leaders and their trial to one Roman authority after another, being transported from prison to prison to prison until he finally makes his way to Rome, the ultimate authority. And it's there, while being held captive in Rome, that Paul writes this letter to the church at Philippi. And, and we see that Paul tries to encourage the church. In fact, in verses 13 and 14, what Paul says is, hey, I know it looks like things are terrible for me, but just know, take confidence God is actually doing a great thing through this. He says, in, in my being in chains and being transported all over the Roman Empire from one to another, so the gospel, the good news of Jesus is going with me, and it advances with me even in prison to encourage the church to help those who've yet to hear the good news be changed. And Paul says, take heart in all of this. Christ is being exalted. And in verse 18, Paul says, and because of this, because of, of Christ being exalted, he says, I rejoice. And I will continue to rejoice. This while living in what you and I would consider truly horrific circumstances. We find Paul Rejoicing, celebrating. In fact, Paul, when he reiterates, repeats himself and says, I will continue to rejoice. Uh, that's the Greek word for rejoice, but in the present tense, which means it's an ongoing action. I will keep rejoicing. And the powerful thing about this is that, is that this means that it will be unbroken. That's the part of using that verb, is that this is going to continue to happen and nothing will stand in my way from doing this. So Paul's saying, I am rejoicing here, church, even in this, and I will keep rejoicing no matter what happens to me. No matter what my life looks like. And that's a powerful word for us because as we look at Paul's circumstances, like they are grim. And Paul's life is shrouded in uncertainty. Paul doesn't know whether he's going to live or whether he'll be executed. And yet we find him rejoicing and saying nothing Nothing will stop my rejoicing. Man, we, we read about Paul's attitude further in beginning in verse 19 and working through verse 24. Just listen to the man in chains facing uncertainty. Like, like listen to the words and the kind of heart that these words would come out of. He says to the church, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul says, my hope isn't just that I'll be released. My hope is that Christ will be exalted, whether by my, my being released and going on and living, or whether it's not that I die and am raised with Christ. Either way, it's not my will that determines whether I will have joy. There's not a condition to my rejoicing. Whatever happens, life or death, I will keep on rejoicing that Christ may be exalted. In verse 21, he says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what will I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But it is more necessary for me that I remain with you. That I remain in the body. I mean, Paul tells the church, as much as it's up to me, I'll stay alive for you. 
we find Paul in what you and I would consider to be a nightmare. Facing uncertainty. And if you've ever been in a season of your life of uncertainty, you know how unsettling that can be. When you feel you're threading the edge between life and death, between the future you want and the one that you don't want. That's where Paul is. And yet, what we discover is that Paul's joy is undiminished even by his circumstances. I was reading through Philippians and through my interruptions of my children, you know, and, and God, like this thing just kind of overwhelmed me in reading this of just saying, Paul, like, Paul, and you're in chains. Like, you don't know what your future holds for you. Like, how can you have joy? Like, how can you have, how can you say that nothing will stop my rejoicing? And, and I begin to think of my life, and maybe this holds true for you in your own experience, but how often in our lives have we allowed our circumstances to dictate our joy? Have we said of our circumstances, you have the power to either prop up my joy or to snatch it away? It's easy to live like that. And it's easy, easy to live with that kind of fragile joy in the midst of the world. And yet when we look at Paul, we see one whose joy is so powerful it overcomes and seems to transcend his circumstances. And the question for us is, Paul, how, how do you have joy in the chains? How do you have joy amidst the uncertainty of life and death? How are you so confident that you can keep on rejoicing? Well, the answer to that question is found in Philippians chapter 3. I believe. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me there. I think this is, a quite, this is a place where Paul tells the church here is how I found joy. A joy that's greater than the circumstances in my life. And we see in, in chapter 3 what Paul does is just as he shares his, his experience and life with them in chapter 1. So in chapter 3, Paul gives us a glimpse of his life. But this is a glimpse into Paul's life well before he received the call of Christ to go preach on any missionary journey. And what Paul does for the church is he begins to share with them, hey, here is my source. Here was my source of hope and joy in my life for a long time. And he says, here's what I looked at in my life to give me meaning and purpose. The kind of meaning that I believed if I gained this and was able to do this, then it would give me the kind of satisfaction that I want and expect and dream of for my own soul. And beginning in verse 5, we look at what Paul says. And, and man, um, what we see is that Paul's list of what he believed would fill him and give him significance was built on his own accomplishments and his reputation. He says, look, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In regards to the law, the, the law of God, I was a Pharisee, meaning no one, no one beat me in their commitment to the law. As for zeal, I even persecuted the church, which I believe was doing God the ultimate favor. And as for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. In other words, I was the guy that everyone looked at who got it right in their life who obeyed, that other people envied and said, this is the kind of person that we want to strive to be. If you're hearing that list and thinking, I don't seem to understand what Paul is really saying, here's an easy way to think of this. Paul is saying, I achieved in my life moral and spiritual excellence. I was the guy in my community. The one that everyone envied. 
who said, surely if someone had good standing before God, it was me. It was the Apostle Paul. And Paul said, in that season, that's what I sought to find joy in. In my own goodness, my own capacity to obey God, to do everything that religion said I needed to do to win. And yet if you read, in Romans chapter 7, Paul gives us a deeper look of what was going on in his heart, in his life, in this season where he was supposedly winning. Paul says, in spite of doing everything, my community said to be faithful and obedient, to earn God's favor and blessing, to be righteous, to stand out, to be better than other people. Paul says, I did all these things, and in the end, I still was lost. I leaned on everything everyone told me to do, and and in the inside, I was a broken man. And the way Paul describes what was going on in his heart and his life, even in this season, when he had a resume that you and I could not match, Paul says, I was dying on the inside. Can you imagine? Like, like maybe you know what that means to feel like you're dying or wasting away on the inside. And Paul looks at and he says, I've, I've gotten to the end. I've done everything they told me to do that I needed to do. And I feel like I'm dying. And he asks a question. He says, man, who can save me? If I can't save myself by... By being good and doing all the things the world's telling me to do, like, who who can save me? And for Paul, the answer to that question comes in Acts chapter 9. When on a dusty road, heading into the city of Damascus, the risen Jesus confronts Paul. And it's there before the risen Jesus in all of his glory that everything changes for Paul. Paul says when confronted with the awesome reality of Jesus, of his presence in my life, Paul said, in just a moment, in seeing him, and experiencing his grace and his mercy and his love and his lordship. Paul says, in just a moment, like like all of a sudden, everything I valued, everything that I sought to have purpose in my life, material possessions, reputation, all of it, like it just fell away. I realized in comparison it was nothing in light of the one who was standing before me. Listen to what he says, starting in verse 7. It's Paul talking about that moment and what he discovered in Jesus. He says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but a righteousness that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, of my trusting in what Jesus has done for me. And Paul concludes, he says, man, I want to know Christ Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and even participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Paul says, man, that moment, in that moment, I realized there was one thing that matters in this life. And it has nothing to do with my accomplishments. 
my goodness, what I could gain and gather for myself and my reputation. It was knowing Christ. That's one who saved me. You know what Paul tells us in the book of Philippians about where and how we find joy? Paul will tell you, I found joy because Jesus found me. Yeah. I found joy because Jesus found me. Because Jesus, knowing Jesus is joy, that's the gift of joy. It comes from, from Jesus himself. You see, in the Bible, joy is not something we seek and then hope to find. In the book of Philippians, joy is a gift that Jesus gives to his people. It's not something to seek and find. It's a gift that he gives to his people. You know, so often I think we get this backwards. We assume joy is is something that we, we make our pursuit, that if we want joy, then it makes obvious sense to us that we, we look at joy as the end goal of our life and we use everything that we are, all of our energy and resources, to chase joy, that if we get to the end of the rainbow, we'll finally have the joy and satisfaction that we want. And, and what C.S. Lewis, going back to him and, and his, his book, Surprised by Joy, C.S. Lewis says the surefire way to not get joy is to make it the goal of your life. That if you don't want joy, <laughs> then, then seek it. Then make it your pursuit of your life. And he says why? He says here's why you're doomed to never get joy if you're pursuing joy as a means to an end. He said what will happen and the problem with it is that we're putting all of the focus actually on ourselves. That if we're pursuing joy, what we're really looking at is our life. And he says a life like that doesn't expand in the way that it's meant to. It just shrinks upon itself. And the more you look inward into yourself, the less likely you are to ever find the joy that will truly satisfy your soul. We don't find joy there. Here's the thing, church. Paul, Paul didn't find joy. Joy found him. And it found him because Jesus found him. Joy is just the gift. It's the byproduct of the greater thing, which is knowing Jesus. It just accompanies a relationship that we were made to know that has changes us and who we are. And if Paul was to speak to you today about how it is, if you're wondering how I can find joy in my life, he would say that. I mean, joy comes through Jesus and what he's done for me and knowing him. And he would say nothing in your pursuit of your life will matter anything to experiencing joy like knowing Christ. Because for Paul, facing chains, facing an uncertain future, the one thing that the Jews or Romans could not take from him was his knowing Jesus. And they could take his freedom. They could take his life. But Paul says in the end, they can't take anything from me. They can't take, what my, they can't take the one from me who fills me with life who fills me with peace and hope and joy. They can do nothing to take that from me. Therefore, the joy I have in knowing Jesus is not subject to the decision they make about my faith. I will continue to have joy. And I think about that for, for you and for me, for for us today who might be reeling and battling and considering where can I find joy in my life? We're going to come to a time of prayer and, and whether you're someone who maybe you're going through something in your life, a hardship, a, a time of grief, 
of uncertainty that you feel like joy is just missing in your life. Um, maybe you're someone who has never in your life turned to Jesus. And maybe you're saying, Jesus, man, I, I like Paul, I want to know you. I want the greater thing in life, which is to know you and a life and joy that just comes along with you. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Would you bow? Jesus, we thank you for being the one who loves us far more than we can ever know. Who offers yourself for us that we, by trusting you, might have life through you. We pray that the words of the Apostle Paul would resonate in our hearts. That we might run to you as our source of joy. That we might understand that it, what it means to know you. So that those who are walking in seasons of despair and seasons of uncertainty, may you part the fog of these things so that they might see your glory as the Apostle Paul did. And may it transform their perspective and their hearts that they may find in you the greatest gift of all. Open the hearts and eyes of those who have yet to trust you, yet to put their hope and their confidence in you, that they may find you, the Lord and Savior, who's ever ready to pour out your life. We love you and invite you to move in our lives as we respond by singing. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand and sing together. The altar is again open. If you want to come down and pray for yourself or someone, or maybe this for you is a first step of faith in saying, I'm Jesus, I'm, I'm looking to you. I want to know you like Paul. Um, and this is maybe a place for you to respond. Maybe it's for you to pray for, for someone in your life. Uh, you're welcome to respond in our time. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed are the Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be fed, they will be fed. This is the kingdom, this is the kingdom, this is the kingdom of heaven, ask and
important sing seek first the king so seek first the kingdom and all will be at seek first the kingdom and all will be at seek first the kingdom and all will be at all will be at all will be at it seek first the kingdom and all will be at seek first the kingdom and all will be at seek first the kingdom and all will be at all will be at all will be at it seek first the kingdom and all will be at seek first the kingdom and all will be at seek first the kingdom and all will be at all will be at all will will be at seek first the kingdom and all will be at it seek first the kingdom and all will be at it all will be at it we will be filled we will be filled this is the kingdom this is the kingdom this is the kingdom of heaven, ask it he will, ask it he will. This is the kingdom, this is the kingdom, this is the kingdom of heaven. So seek first the kingdom, and all will be at seek first the kingdom. a little bit better. Um, I'm beginning to think that popping sound is kind of like the Oscars. When you start going too long, it just kind of pops up there, you know, so uh, it's like, come on, come on, preacher, get to the point. Um, uh, no, thank you for being here. Gosh, what a great day to celebrate our amazing God. I, I love uh, the book of Philippians. Look forward to spending the next few weeks uh, in, in that letter. Encourage you to study with us. Uh, just as far as announcements go, one of the big ones is that not this Wednesday, since it's the first day of school, but the next Wednesday, we will start our Wednesday night programs. So we're so excited for that opportunity. Uh, be looking at that and would love to, for you to join us for all the activities. Uh, it's going to be a great thing. As you leave or walk out those doors, we have a bookmark for you uh, for this series. Uh, and it actually has on it Paul's prayer for the church in Philippians 1. 
1, verses 9 through 11, a powerful prayer. We invite you to pray and would love for you to study through the book of Philippians um, and our waypoints with us uh, as well. Um, another announcement, um, and I'm going to ask Carl Johnson to come down right now. Um, uh, I, so on Wednesday, I'm going to Africa. Um, if you're like, I haven't heard of this, not many people have. So I'm just, uh, I'm going on a mission trip on behalf of the church. Uh, Mansfield, First Methodist Mansfield has a partnership over there. They're really excited about it and been invested in for years. And they're inviting me and a couple of their pastors to come and just kind of witness firsthand the, the fruit of this ministry. And so I'm going on behalf of the church to explore whether this is an opportunity God is calling us to or not. So for nine days, uh, I'll be over in Tanzania. So please be in prayer for me. And it is always customary at our church that we pray for those who are going on mission trips. So I'm going to ask Carl, our administrative council chair, to come down and pray for me. Uh, you can kind of just put your hands out as a blessing if you want to. Um, and I'll have Carl pray. Okay, if you'd pray with us. Father, we thank you for church for what it means to be united together as a church and um, we thank you for Brady we thank you for the good counsel that he provides to us the leadership that he does and and Lord we're so excited and so thankful to you for the opportunity uh, to allow him to go over to Tanzania um, we thank you for the partner church that we'll be with over there we ask that in your grace that you would open people's minds and hearts uh, in Tanzania that they would be receptive to the gospel that we would see um, wonderful things um, and, and that those things would be brought back here to the church that, that Brady would witness those things that others that go uh, in your name would witness those things and they would just make their path smooth for them that uh, the travel would be safe and efficient um, that um, hearts would be opened and that you would give the team there a resilience and a sense of just um, grace spirit and strength to be able to to, uh, to see what's going on and then to bring those good things back here. Uh, Lord, we, we praise you. We thank you for these opportunities. And in all of this, we ask that your name would be lifted up above everything else, that that would be our focus and, and our mission. Um, we lift your name up above all others, and we thank you. It's your name we pray today. Amen. Carl. Um, so our fun is not over with. So we have our carnival uh, for just kind of celebrating and uh, hoping to have some, some fun before the school year starts. Uh, so we'll have food over here. So as soon as I'm done with the benediction, y'all can go eat. There's games all over the place. Y'all just have fun. That's what this day is about. So hang around as long as you'd like. Uh, we'd love for you to, to be here. Um, so uh, I want to just, as, as a benediction today, our blessing, we're going to listen to the words of Jesus. Uh, who tells us, don't seek joy. He says, seek me. In Matthew 6.33, he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all the things you want will be added unto you. Pursue me, not joy, and you'll find everything the heart longs for uh, through me. So may that be our focus. In the name of Jesus, we go. Amen. <laughs>